afternoon, so apparently they're real. Um, and thanks everyone else for stealing about half of my presentation. It's always bad when you come last because everything's already been said, so I'm going to rush through some of this and get to the interesting stuff. John asked me to say something positive. I'm going to try my best. Um, I'm not going to talk about Brexit um, because I'm sure I'll sick of it. I know I am. Uh, I know it's very important. Um, I'm not even going to talk about the European Union, which I could do at length, um, pet topic of mine. Um, and I could describe the European Union to you that you don't or perhaps won't recognise. Um, I could talk about the Fiscal Compact Treaty and the, the, the successive treaties and so on. Um, I could talk at length about EU militarisation and the EU battle groups and the European Defence Agency and the fact that the European Union is now, or the Europe anyway, produces about 30% of all global arms exports. And I could describe this anti-democratic monstrosity to you from my perspective, this kind of Frankenstein's monster. Uh, but then someone will point out, yeah, he's got nice eyes, isn't he? And that kind of sums up my debate about the European Union. It's just completely lopsided and one-sided. Um, the one thing we can agree on, I think, and everyone's made the point so far, is that Brexit in part, at least, and Trump in part, at least, and the rise of right populism, indeed fascism in Europe. You have tens of thousands of fascists walking on streets where 70 years ago they were rounding up Jews for the concentration camps. That's how serious things are getting in parts of Europe. It, it is in part a result of the financial crash of 2008. And the financial crash, of course, of 10 years ago is, a, is kind of a malaise with deeper malaise and systemic crises within capitalism that date right the way back to the 1970s. And no one's really talking about that either. Um, we can also agree, perhaps, that there's going to be another crash within the next two to three years, being currently predicted by people who predicted the last one. Another thing we can agree on is that the last 10 years have been really fucking miserable for an awful lot of people. Um, and we have a new kind of language to describe this new landscape. If you're involved in, uh, as John said before, under, trying to understand political economy and understanding how global capitalism works, it's all about collateralized debt obligations and derivatives and quantitative easing and liquidity and credit crunches. But if you're just a punter, it's about precariousness and the precariat and the gig economy and in-work poverty and underemployment. A new language, if you like, to describe the, a new reality for tens of millions of people in Europe. Uh, and of course, everyone's pointed the fact that as global capitalism continues to fail, and as inequality both within and across nations continues to deepen and get worse, there's a, pr a fairly predictable reactionary backlash, and that, that common narrative of taking back control, as if we had control in the first place. You know, and, and when you get back this sort of this imaginary control, who are you going to hand it over to? Quite literally, the same people who have the same ideas that caused the crash in the first place. That's the kind of lunacy of that position. Um, and to people like that, I know we make a buffoon of them, but dangerous people. I mean, we talked about Gove and that kind of that south of east of England cabal that now runs a Tory party. Um, the, the, there was a phrase in the Green Movement, and I, I understood years ago, de-development. It's been adopted by some of the Tories now. De-development to them means stripping away 60 or 70 years of progress in terms of social and public services and rights. And, and, and collapsing our living standards so that we can compete with China and Southeast Asia as they come up. That's what they mean by de-development. Um, and so uh, I suppose the question for us is what, what do we do about all of this and I, was, I had the privilege a couple of weeks ago of being in Madrid, I was invited over by the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation and um, one of the reasons we went was we were able to meet people who are involved in a new kind of, kind of grassroots politics that you're seeing popping up all across Europe and I had a chat with David McBurney originally this morning because those ideas are now emerging everywhere, particularly in Europe and also in, in South America as well and, there, and, and that's one of the ideas we spoke about at length in, uh, in Spain, radical municipalism. And it's not just local government, it's, it's local democracy very differently. Because we feel that we've lost so much power at the, at the national level, that power's left parliaments and it's gone to supranational bodies, whether it's the European Union or CETA or some free trade agreement or whether it's the WTO or the IMF, people are turning back to the grassroots to express their, their democratic will. Um, and radical municipalism, a grassroots strategy based on promoting the protection and expansion of the commons and the public good. That's the fundamental underlying principle of that. Not, not the market and private property, but the commons and the, and the public good. And the thing we liked about it as well is it's a positive framing of language. It's a positive narrative for people to buy into. And linked to that, of course, I know many people know an awful lot about it, is the solidarity economy and the promotion of economic democracy. And I'll talk very briefly to both of those, um, if I get a chance. Um, and the, the first one, I suppose, that idea of um, Radical municipalism is very different from our understanding of normal elect kind of representative democracy where we elect people who might be very, very radical and belong to a radical party. You're sending them to these neoliberalized institutions and they spend 10 years in there fighting away like good ones and achieving nothing because the power isn't there. They don't carry the power. Radical municipalism seeks to 
almost strip power out of those institutions, bring them back to the streets, back to the squares, and build a kind of social power that if you then decide to develop an electoral strategy based on social power, you can send people back into those institutions and fundamentally change them. We met people from Barcelona, Barcelona on Camus and uh, Ada Calau, the mayor there, fascinating what they're doing because they're really, had, they're really struggling and have a, a popular citizens' assembly. And they're struggling with the idea that how do you change these institutions? When you get into the state, the state has control over you, you don't have control over it. Fascinating debates. And what they're doing to prevent their elected politicians becoming neoliberalised is not letting them stay in there too long. They have them out back on the streets in citizens' assemblies involved in participatory budgeting to remind them who they're there to represent. Um, it kind of disperses power, I suppose, and then builds power so that we, we creates leverage. Um, in Naples, uh, the local mayor there, De Magistris, in 2016, last year, his first action was to create a department of the commons. Radical, fantastic idea. Government Resolution 446, the identification of areas of civic importance described to the category of the commons. The administration defines the common goods as the tangible and intangible assets of collective belonging that are managed in a shared participatory process and that is committed to ensure collective enjoyment of common goods and their preservation for the... Imagine if that was a law everywhere. That's a random, that's, that's actually really existing utopian communism, isn't it? That's saying we're going to protect the commons. We're not allowing anything to be privatised. No one group of private interests will control what we collectively own together. Um, and of course, then, Barcelona on Camus is perhaps the flagship of participatory democracy in Europe, uh, with Adolf Halau, the mayor there, where they don't have meetings in the institutions, they literally have them on the streets. That's where they're happening in citizens' assemblies all, all, over, all over that part of the world, and in Madrid as well, of course. The last one, of course, I suppose, is links me to my next point, is um, Cooperation Jackson, which was, which was a, they have had electoral success, they do have an electoral strategy, but it's an electoral strategy once again based upon the building of social power. Their social power comes out of economic democracy. They've set up dozens and dozens of cooperatives all across uh, Jackson City, um, and out of that they've taken control, if you like, of, of large sections of the economy. Uh, it always struck me as very strange why people who love political democracy don't even talk or consider economic democracy. Uh, if you believe in democracy, it's always been, sorry, where am I? A mystery to me why that democracy that you believe in doesn't apply to the place where you work. After all, five out of seven days of the week, most of your adult life are at work. I'm, I'm spoiled because I've been working in a democratic organisation for nearly 20 years. In fact, I'm, I, I know now I'm completely unemployable. No one else would ever employ me. If I went into an institution and someone told me to do something, I'd go, fuck off, you do it, that's a good idea. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't exist in those institutions, and I know I'm spoiled by that, but the idea that we don't like political tyranny, and we spent 150, 200 years fighting against political tyranny, but we're dead on with economic tyranny. We're dead on with handing over our assets to private interests. One man in Grangemouth in Scotland can control most of British energy. Apparently that's okay. Economic democracy is as radical, if not more radical, than political democracy, and the changes we need to see there. And there are examples all around the world, and I know you know them, and I know we're on that time. I'll flash through them. We went to Mondragon as part of our kind of study tour, and you know Mondragon in the Basque Country, the world's largest worker cooperative, about 75,000 worker owners, has its own bank, its own university, um, uh, 74,000, yeah, has its own bank which didn't collapse, has its own university, it's a cooperative university. Um, and they have very, very different ways of dealing with recessions because they are capitalists in the sense that they make goods and services which they sell into an international market. The big difference, of course, when the profits come back in, they're divided amongst the workers. The workers are the shareholders. And there's no one class of shareholders just stripping out wealth, which is the model, of course, of, of, of neoliberal capitalism. We also went to Marinaleda, um, which is a fascinating place to visit if you ever get a chance. It's in Andalusia in southern Spain. In about 1978, they accidentally elected an anarcho-communist mayor. He's still there to this day. Um, I'll give you one example of what they did. There's no police force in Marinaleda, by the way. There's no housing crisis in Marinaleda, and there's no unemployment. It's only part of the European Union with zero unemployment. In Marinaleda, um, the local council bought and expropriated thousands of square metres of land. Uh, land building materials and architectural plans are provided to any self-builder, if you're a local citizen, you get this for free. Free assistance from builders, if, you're, you know, if you haven't got hands to white grown arse, you can get someone to give you a hand. Um, the hours spent in sweat equity by the resident on construction is deducted from the total cost. Finally, a monthly payment of 15 euros is arranged for the resident to achieve ownership. What's the catch, do you think? To rent speculation, you're not allowed to sell your house. And that's what you call regulating the market, i.e. there's no market in housing in Marinaleda. Now, I know that will never work here, and I know that all of these examples aren't applicable everywhere else, but there are examples everywhere of different ways of doing things. The, the motto in Marinaleda is building the future now. And that idea of practical utopias is something that we have to start getting our head around because people need 
to understand that there's hope and there's possibility for change. Otherwise, we'll never recruit them into progressive positions and progressive policy if they think there's no chance of it happening. Emilia Romagna, another one in uh, Gran Bologna in Italy. Another example, these are all very different examples, but all about building a solidarity economy. In Emilia Romagna, it's called the Red Belt, the Communist Party, the partisans when they came down from the hills after the Second World War. They didn't really get involved in politics. They got involved in business, and they set up hundreds, if not thousands, of cooperatives in the 50s and 60s. 50% 50 of the population are in co-ops, and they employ 10% of the workforce and 30% of the GDP. In Ireland, it's less than 1%. <coughs> it gives you an, 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 a, a comparator. In Bologna itself, 15 of the 50 largest businesses are cooperatives. Unemployment is 3%. The massive presence of cooperative firms is a stabilizing factor in the regional economy. It's the opposite of foreign direct investment. It's the opposite of allowing capital flow to go into your, into your country and then out again when they've taken what they need. It locks in local gain, it locks in money, and it allows that money then, of course, to circulate amongst the people who live there. Uh, because the one thing, if you're a member of a co-op, you don't do, you don't sell your own labor share to someone else, you keep it. You have title of ownership over the product of your own labor. <coughs> and in the 220 regions of the EU, Emilia Romagna is in the top 10, along with, I might add, I might add um, Mondragon in the Basque country. Uh, we were so impressed by the idea of that, that when we came back, because we, I worked for, I didn't say at the start, the anti-sectarian union of the Irish Labour Movement, which is a deeply depressing union to work in, to be honest, for 20 years. And when we came back, we thought, is there anything else we could do that might be positive? And we thought, well, we'll set up a worker cooperative. 2011, I think it was. Kelly's over there. She was part of the process. Um, three years after the worst financial crash in 80 years, we, th we said we were going to set up a business on the interface between the Shankland Falls. And it became the Belfast Cleaning Society, which is a fairly good, employs about 10 women, a couple of ex-prisoners involved, a business. Um, they won, the first contract was MTV in 2011, and then tenants fight, and they grew out of that. We also helped set up the Creative Workers Co-op, Farmageddon Brewery, also Boundary Brewery, and uh, we also helped set up Lumister Cafe, and now we're the only, well, there's two now accredited bodies in, in the north of Ireland at least that help corporate development. All of that done without a single penny from local or regional government. And I, I, I know and I understand the potential that if local government decided it would invest in a solidarity economy where you build local capacity, you build human potential, and you lock in the wealth to local communities, the money doesn't leak out. It stays there because local people spend their money locally. And there is a real economic um, kind of necessity for, like, for having a strong cooperative sector and a solidarity economy, and it's just not even on the table to be discussed. We've been negotiating with the City Council for five years and we've basically gone nowhere. No one's interested. And that's what I mean by those neoliberalised institutions. They're just stuck in a particular way of working. Belfast's model is foreign direct investment and property speculation. And a little bit of tourism, if, if, if you want. That's it, really. There's nothing outside that. Um, now, how do you do these things? How are all of these... Oh, there's the most recent one. I was, uh, Kelly's going to... I'm going to creep Kelly out now. I went on our Facebook live this morning and got off her Facebook. That's, that's the most recent uh, cooperative we've helped set up, which is Hart Larissa, a small trading cooperative. But we do that on our own. There's no assistance, there's no help. And so the, but the potential is massive um, for building a solidarity economy. Um, now, how do you do that? You do that by building big coalitions. All of those examples I've given across Europe and South America are coalition-based. Whether they're citizens' platforms or political party coalitions, it isn't one party that's taking control. It can't be. It's impossible. We know that from our own political history everywhere in Europe. It's very rare for that to happen. Um, and we have our own, in the South at least, an attempt and a coalition. I was heavily involved in the Right to Water campaign and the Right to Change campaign, which was at least the first time you saw in Ireland different groups, very different groups, including Trotskyist elements and communist parties and trade unions and community groups coming together to fight for a, a broad social movement, which led to the Right to Change movement. And we had eight or nine of the largest demonstrations the Republic of Ireland has ever seen. Um, I could go into that in more detail, I don't have time. Um, but it is about coalition building, I'm, I'm convinced of that now. And it is about building social power outside of institutions in order to affect change within them and, and have radical social transformation. Um, and if you're interested, there's an event next week in Dublin, the Manson House, um, for the right to change. Um, Winnie Wong, who was the woman who came up with the hashtag Feel the Burn, is speaking, as is the Vice Chair of Momentum in Britain speaking at it. And it's just an attempt, it may fail, it probably will, at building broad coalitions in Ireland um, to affect change, even if, it's not a, even if it doesn't have an electoral strategy of its own, you can build social movements that put pressure on the mainstream to shift to progressive and left positions as well, in a kind of a broad social movement lobbying group, if you want to put it in that sense. Um, and so there are possibilities. And we need to start doing that now, I suppose, because 
this particular audience, uh, before all others I can imagine speaking to, knows that we're running out of time. And so, you know, the time to do something is now, not, not next year. Cheers, thank you. Go on, Mike.